two weeks ago, we saw our very first spring training game in the Cactus League. We saw the Arizona Diamondbacks versus the Texas Rangers sitting along the first baseline in 70 degree weather and lots of sunshine. It felt as if the world was really teeming with life once again. Green grass and blue skies, birds chattering, the crowd buzzing, the crack of the baseball bat and the thud of the ball hitting the glove, running, sliding, dust flying, the roar of engines from F-16s and F-22s from Luke Air Force Base doing their training runs. And F-35s, yes. And then the shouts of people, here, 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 as a player from the Rangers chucks the ball over to the net to the crowd. The signs of spring, the signs of life, the signs of the ordinary, the signs of movement were fully at hand. The lengthening of days and the spring air and sun certainly bring an emergence of possibility to a church season that is filled with wilderness wandering. On this day in particular, in the wildernesses of grief, we hear the cries of a psalmist to the holy watch as dry bones are called back to life and gasp as Lazarus emerges alive and is unbound by the community. And explore then the concept of hope. The season of Lent has the ability to do that. The season of Lent takes us to places with all the fields, uncertainty, loss, grief, pain, despair, outrage, and then sprinkles hope throughout, especially on this Sunday, when all seems lost and very dead. Where is the hope in these scriptures? Reading these scriptures counters a narrative that we are surrounded by day in and day out. It counters a narrative that is often overpowered by racism, xenophobia, terrorism, war, and death. Reading these script scriptures offers a lens of encouragement on a day filled with plans for the future and budget numbers. <coughs> Hope can feel impossible. And yet it is precisely in the face of these challenges that God invites us to read the stories of new life and new hope. How can we give in when God is so loudly proclaiming life in the midst of chaos? How can we give in when God is so loudly proclaiming life in the midst of death? How can we share with others the hope that oozes from passages like these? Ezekiel is writing to a community in exile, still reeling from the unimaginable disaster of the loss of both homeland and temple. Their identity and their religion were both shattered, and yet the dry bones were called to life once again. How can the dry bones and the life of our community be brought back to life once again? For many people, a sense of hopelessness is real, is tangible. We can readily relate to finding a valley filled with dry bones and devoid of every sense of life. We experience collective grief at the loss of vast amounts of innocence, understanding, and camaraderie. Like Mary and Martha, we may want to confront God with anger. If you had just been here, the list of things would have not happened. When confronted with these realities, it is vital to explore the concept of hope, hope that is transformative and lasting, 
and yet may need to come slowly. It is also far more important than getting bogged down in arguments over whether things related in Scripture actually happened or not. That is virtually never the point. The point that runs through all the readings this week is about God bringing us hope when all seems lost. We celebrate that even in despair, even when the world seems to be plotting against God, still God says, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. With all this foreshadowing of what will take place from Hosanna's to the Last Supper to a horrific death to the hope of resurrection, the dry bones in the valley signal to us that life is not over. The cloths that once bound Lazarus do not stay bound. God is never far from our grasp, and yet we certainly love to yell, here, 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 when all seems lost. After worship today, we'll take some time to review where life is sprouting in our church life together and how we contend and nurture our growth. Why? Why? Well, because it's what responsible leadership does. Because at the annual meeting of the congregation in December, we said we would. So during our time together, we will present to you a strategic plan, taking the responses we received from our meetings with all of you last fall and with the guidance of Jill White, our mission interpreter from UCC Building and Loan, the writing team synthesized all the information and put together what we hope for in year one, and then what we hope for in years two through five. And now is an opportunity to hear from you and what you think, and are we on target? And after we hear about the strategic plan, we're going to discuss our budget. And budgets are realities to churches and nonprofits. They help us focus on what we can afford. However, when you partner a budget next to a strategic plan, together they become a driving force for what we want to produce, our outcome, our mission and goals, and how then we can make it a reality. Gathering together on Sunday mornings is important work. Worshiping and praising God and building community is vital. And our life together as Christians is so much more. And Jesus wants us to do so much more as he too did more than just worship. He healed and he wept. He met people where they were. He gathered those on the margins and pushed the limits of societal mores. He asked questions and invited people of all walks of life to the table. He ate with sinners much like you and me, and he prayed. And Jesus commands us to come out, to be unbound from that which holds us down, and to be free. There is life all around us. There is opportunity all around us. God is all around us, breathing life into our dry bones so that we can live out our call and be free.